Well, good afternoon, folks. Thanks so much for joining us for the Habitat Hero program, Gardening for Hummingbirds. For those of you who might not know me, I'm Jamie Weiss. I'm the Habitat Hero Coordinator for Audubon Rockies. And joining us today is none other than David Salmon. He's our Chief Horticulturist for High Country Gardens. And with this program, Gardening for Hummingbirds, David's gonna regale us with all things plant and hummingbird related. We're gonna learn all the tips and tricks on attracting these charismatic birds into your garden. And over the years, we have certainly enjoyed partnering with High Country Gardens. They have been a strong supporter of Audubon Rocky since 2014 now. And we work with them on programs, planting events, seed packets, giveaways, you name it. And today, like I mentioned, David will be joining us to give this wonderful program on gardening for hummers. I'm sure you all know who David is, but I'm going to just give a quick little bio to introduce him and set the stage. Uh, he was a 1979 graduate um, from CSU here in Fort Collins. He has a degree in horticultural science and was the founder Santa, of Santa Fe Greenhouse, which is a retail greenhouse and nursery located in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And that was from the years of 1984 through 2012. And then after that, the High Country Gardens mail order catalog, that was from 1993 until present day. Uh, David's also a founding member of Plant Select. Uh, let's see, he's also currently working with the new owners of High Country Gardens as chief horticulturist and operates a, host, a wholesale retail greenhouse and plant development company called Waterwise Gardening LLC. Oh my goodness, 35 years, 35 plus years now, um, hands-on experience. David has extensive expertise in a wide range of horticultural endeavors. So we're really excited to get David out of the greenhouse today and share <laughs> his wonderful plant knowledge with all of us. So with that, David, feel free to jump on in. Well, thank you, Jamie. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be one of the presenters in the um, Habitat Hero series this year. And um, I'm going to be talking about bringing hummingbirds into your life via gum, uh, gardening for hummingbirds. So we can see on the opening screen uh, a little uh, Rufus hummingbird in my garden uh, sipping at uh, one of their favorite uh, group of plants, the Agastache. And this is a, a, a hybrid that I developed, oh gosh, it's been a little over 20 years ago, Agastache Ava, that showed up in, in my garden as a volunteer seedling. And I recognized it as a really special plant and it's been in cultivation ever since. And clearly the little hummingbirds enjoy it as a natural nectar source as well. Next. Now, it's really important to create a hummingbird friendly landscape in your yard that provides for the basic needs of hummingbirds and other pollinators because they all have a common interests uh, centered around flowers and water. Um, a healthy, organically or naturally grown landscape with a, a diversity of different herbaceous and woody plants encourages the greatest number of the hummingbirds. And the other thing that's really important is to keep your landscape free from chemical pesticides and other chemical garden chemicals, especially these systemics. You'll see them uh, uh, in all the big box stores and unfortunately in a lot of garden centers too. Any, any of these uh, quote unquote systemic, you apply it once and it protects your plants for uh, you know six months or 12 months, uh, those poison the nectar. So if you use these systemic uh, pesticides, they will taint the nectar with these, these um, very toxic pesticides. So it's really important, uh, run a clean garden. Uh, grow organically wherever possible, or at least naturally, and, and give up on the chemicals. So next, uh, oh, well, actually what we're looking, we're looking at uh, four or five of the, the very basics of creating a, a hummingbird friendly landscape. And of course, uh, shelter for nesting and resting is really important. And as you can see here, this is a picture in my yard taken at dusk. And the 
little hummingbird is sitting on top of a spent uh, yucca flower spike from last year, but I left it on the plant because as you can see, it doesn't have anything on it other than just a little perch. So the hummingbirds like to perch where they can see all around them and, and feel safe from predators because they can see them coming and survey uh, the garden when they're thinking about where to go sip flowers next. Uh, okay, the next slide shows a water source. And of course, anybody that's into bringing birds to uh, one's yard understands the importance of a water source. Even if you don't feed or plant anything, if you have a water source, that's a big draw in itself. But hummingbirds are a little bit different than uh, say ground birds or um, uh, songbirds or many of the other birds because they like to have water that drips, splashes or sprays. They don't, uh, they can't utilize uh, a still pond or a still uh, bird bath. So as you can see here, there's a dripping fountain on one side and the hummingbirds will um, literally fly right into the, the dripping or spraying water so that number one, they can wash off the nectar that accumulates on their feathers so that they can bathe and they can also drink. So provide a moving source of water if at all possible. Next is uh, talking about food source. Now, especially when hummingbirds move north in the spring and um, here in New Mexico in the front range of Colorado, I'm, I'm not as sure about Western Colorado, but I know at front range of Colorado and um, central and Eastern New Mexico, the hummingbirds start moving north in early April. And as you're well aware, there are not a lot of flowers in bloom, uh, shrubs, perennials in bloom that early. So I think that hummingbirds actually depend a lot on eating protein to sustain themselves as they're moving north to find their summer uh, nesting grounds. So you can see in the picture here, uh, a Hesperello spike that has a few aphids on it. And there was a, I was out in my yard when a little flock of titmice came flying by and boy, they, they saw lunch and they uh, gathered on the, the Hesperello spikes and are feeding on the soft bodied aphids. Well, the hummingbirds do the same thing. So don't be quick to knock aphids off of plants early in the season because they can be an important protein source for the northward migration of the hummingbirds. Next. And then, um, Something that I've learned over the years is to arrange the plants around your yard that are natural nectar sources for hummingbirds, to spread them out. And this will help give access to more hummingbirds. If uh, at least in New Mexico and probably similar in Colorado, if all the plants, the, the blooming plants are visible from one spot, typically uh, a little aggressive Rufus will kind of stake that out as his. And of course he chases other hummingbirds out, but they learn how to distract him while others uh, come in behind him to sip at the flowers. But you can actually have more rufuses and more other hummingbirds if you have groups of flowers that aren't necessarily visible from uh, one another so that one little rufus can't control the whole garden. So as you can see here, um, looking around the corner of the yard of, of a wall in my yard, uh, you'll see that they'll, as you go around the corner, there'll be a different vignette where the, the hummingbirds can feed without being seen from the front side of the wall as we're looking into the photograph. So spread out your plants so that they're not all visible from one spot and that will bring more birds in. Next. Now let's um, talk about, uh, before we get into these individual plants, I, I wanted to talk about um, looking at replacing uh, hummingbird feeders with natural nectar. Now, I know this may sound like heresy because the traditional way to bring hummingbirds into our gardens has been to put up a sugar water feeder. But what you'll realize once you have a, a yard full of, of flowers that offer, offer natural nectar to hummingbirds is that the hummingbirds will go to the flowers first and then maybe in midday when the flower uh, nectar has been exhausted, they'll go to the feeders. But what I've noticed is that feeders tend to break down the active social order in the gardening 
in the garden. A centralized sugar water source creates what I think lazy birds just clustered around the feeders. They look like a bunch of old men that uh, gathered up at the bar uh, around the feeder. They just sit there and, you know, they'll sip, look around, sip some more. But when you remove the feeder and replace it with natural nectar, it recreates the social order that's so important for hummingbirds. They're just like people. They're a social creature. They don't live in isolation. And so when they need to kind of uh, work themselves through the garden to locate the uh, nectar in the flowers, this creates a social order. And I think that that's a, a very important thing that gets lost when uh, feeding is as easy as just sitting up at the bar and just sipping at the feeder. Now, I know a lot of people will uh, maybe disagree with this, but try it. I, I done this in my greenhouse at Santa Fe one year. We, have a, we had an extensive uh, perennial section and they would be all in flower. So we put out some hummingbird feeders to supplement them. But what we found is the, the feeders went unused and the birds were spending all their time at the flowers. And also I'd like to uh, throw out the thought that natural nectar is healthier by providing a mineral and vitamin rich simple sugars given to them by the plants as opposed to just straight sugar water. It's kind of like the difference for me of drinking a Coca-Cola versus a uh, organic fruit smoothie. There's a lot, yeah, both are nice and sweet, but the fruit smoothie has a lot more nutrition in the, uh, with the sweetness. And I ascertain that the same is true between sugar water and natural nectar uh, collected from plants. So let's go into uh, the plant specifically that, um, and of course this is a short presentation and the list of plants the hummingbirds uh, prefer is quite long. So I'm just gonna hit some unfamiliar plants and some essential plants. And as you'll note, these are all arranged by bloom time. So the other important factor in keeping hummingbirds around your yard is to have flowers that are blooming from as early in the spring as you can till as late as you can find in the fall. In other words, uh, some people, if their garden is all spring bloomers, you're feeding breakfast, but where's lunch and dinner? So that's the importance of having plants that bloom throughout the growing season so that there is a continuous supply of nectar and small insects um, for the hummingbirds to feed on. So Ribes odoratum crandall is a uh, native uh, current, but it is has been selected specifically for the fruit size and fruit flavor. So not only will it help feed the hummingbirds in mid spring, but also provide songbirds and yourselves with uh, delicious currants later in the season. But the ribes in Colorado, they bloom when the hummingbirds arrive. In other words, by early to mid April, when you see the currants in the uh, foothills beginning to bloom with these uh, fragrant yellow flowers, that means that the hummingbirds are in the area because ribes has co-evolved to be pollinated by hummingbirds. So these uh, fragrant little clove scented flowers are a tremendous early season nectar source uh, for the migrating hummingbirds in spring. Next. Now, one wouldn't necessarily think of cactus as being a valued nectar source for hummingbirds, but in fact, uh, there are a number of cactus, particularly the hedgehogs that are in fact, with these big nectar rich uh, scarlet flowers, an excellent hummingbird attracting plant. And this is Echinocerus coccinius or spiny hedgehog. It's extremely cold hardy. It'll take a 30 below zero without uh, batting a spine and it blooms in mid spring, again, that coordinates with the hummingbirds northward migration from Southern New Mexico, Arizona and Northern Mexico as they move north to their nesting grounds. Next. Now we have a lot of uh, vines that attract hummingbirds and, <clears throat> excuse me, and I think one of the very finest is Lanicera sempervirens major wheeler is the cultivar and it's a mid to late spring bloomer depending on if you have it on a warm wall or uh, maybe a protected spot it'll tend to bloom uh, maybe a week or so earlier but the wonderful thing about major wheeler of course these uh, tubular uh, uh, scarlet red flowers are a, a, 
an indicator that it's hummingbird pollinated. But Major Wheeler is probably the longest blooming of any of the vining honeysuckles that I have seen. So it is on the top of my list to cover a fence for uh, providing color and attracting hummingbirds. Next. Now here's another uh, honeysuckle, but one that's um, quite uh, unknown, and that is Lanicera arizonica, or the native Arizona honeysuckle. Now, Major Wheeler, Lanicera sempervirens, um, is native to the uh, East Coast and into the Midwest, whereas Lanicera arizonica, as the name would suggest, is found primarily in um, North Central Arizona at higher elevations. Now, Lanicera arizonica, unlike uh, Major Wheeler, where the, the, the vines want to spiral upward and grab onto things so that they can hold on to it. Uh, the Arizona honeysuckle is actually a ground cover and its branch tips weep. They don't naturally grow up. They actually weep so to cover ground. So I like to use the Arizona honeysuckle to uh, cascade over uh, raised uh, beds, over um, uh, garden walls, things like that. You can train it up a trellis but it's a great ground cover, especially for semi-shade where it grows naturally. Next. Now, many of you are familiar with the heucheras or the coral bells. Again, a good late spring blooming uh, uh, genera. And by and large, they are all uh, red, scarlet, pink with an occasional white. And even though the flowers are small, they are numerous as you can see on the photographed plant and the hummingbirds uh, spend a lot of time at the individual little flowers sipping the nectar out of them. And again, like the Arizona honeysuckle, good for shade and part shade. Next. And of course, penstemons are typical, many penstemons are hummingbird pollinated. And one of my favorites for late spring, it's actually mid to late spring blooming, is peat and penstemon eaten eye or firecracker beard tongue. Now this is native to uh, primarily Utah. It gets up into Idaho, uh, perhaps a little bit of Oregon, but it's widely planted because it's used for um, highway uh, and roadway reseeding. And Pensman etonii is a tall grower, two to three feet with these flaming scarlet blossoms that you know the hummingbirds just love. Next. Uh, the columbine or aquilegia are another uh, excellent genus of wildflowers that attract hummingbirds. As you can see, looking at the yellow flowers, the, the face of the flower is, uh, has behind it what we call uh, tails. And these little tails are where the nectar uh, gathers or spurs is the other word. And the spurs hold the flower nectar. So one of the easiest to grow is Aquilegia chrysantha, golden columbine. It grows in sun or shade, unlike our, um, everybody loves the Rocky Mountain columbine, our, the Colorado state flower with the blue and white flowers, but Colorado um, columbine doesn't like heat. And sometimes when you bring it down to Denver, and certainly as you get down into the Springs and uh, Pueblo, it's just too hot. So. Uh, varieties like Aquilegia chrysantha are not only are they more heat tolerant, but much longer bloomer and hence a better choice in the hummingbird garden. Next. Now this is a, a, a beautiful, very rare columbine that I introduced, gosh, back in 2000, which in some ways seems like yesterday. But uh, this is Aquilegia longissima and I named it Swallowtail. I was lucky enough to purchase a couple of packets of seed by a renowned native plant seed collector who's now retired, Sally Walker, out of Tucson, Arizona. And Aquilegia longissima is only found in three places in the entire world. There's a location in uh, a valley in West Texas. There is a where this seed was collected in a, in a very um, distant, uh, deep canyon in southern Arizona, and then there's one more spot in the Sierra Madre Mountains of northern Mexico, and that's it. That's the only three places in the world where this beautiful but easy to grow columbine 
originates. And you'll see the spurs behind the, the face of the flower can be up to four inches in length. So literally, if you look at your hand, a swallowtail blossom, an individual swallowtail blossom will fit in your hand with these four inch long spurs. It has beautiful blue foliage, which you can see there, is very heat tolerant and grows in sun or shade. So while it's very rare in nature, uh, thanks to nursery propagation, I grow my own plants and collect my own seed I have for many, many years. Uh, this is a great addition to the hummingbird garden. Next. Uh, getting back to the, the penstemon, penstemon penifolius. Uh, this is commonly known as the pine leaf beard tongue and when out of flower looks like a little miniature mugo pine. The uh, foliage are, are needle-like like a pine needle and evergreen. And penstemon penifolius is native to central southern New Mexico and eastern Arizona. So it's very cold hardy, but also uh, a good long bloomer with a variety of flower colors. This is luminous. And when you uh, plant luminous so it can get the afternoon sun, the inside of the tubular flower is actually yellow instead of orange. And so when the sun shines through it, it lights up the interior yellow and literally makes the plant look like somebody turned on an internal light switch, hence the name luminous. Uh, there are yellow flowering penstemon penifoliuses, <coughs> excuse me, scarlet flowered, red flowered. So I grow about six different varieties of, of penstemon penifolius. All of them are excellent for the hummingbirds. Next. <coughs> ah. Now these have really come into favor uh, in the Front Range area over, I'd say, the past decade or so. And these are the Hesperallos or Texas red yuccas. They're, they're not technically a yucca, but a, a lot of uh, common names aren't botanically correct. But we call it Texas red yucca. And this is a, a as you can see, the hummingbirds love the tubular flowers and those little uh, balls that you see on the, the flower spikes, those are actually the seed capsules. On the right side of the screen, you can see coral glow. And coral glow is a Hesperala that um, uh, I discovered uh, many years ago. It was a hummingbird created cross between uh, a yellow flowering, a mother Hesperala and a um, pink red flowering uh, Hesperala from where the pollen was uh, transferred. So the intermediate color is a mix of yellow and red and it comes out coral. And again, you can see in this photo, this is in the uh, later in the afternoon with the sun going down and you can see how it just lights up and makes that coral color glow. So the other nice thing about coral glow is it's essentially uh, sterile. You see a few, like maybe five or six seed pods on this whole big plant but the yellow Hesperallo is essentially sterile as well. So instead of uh, putting a lot of effort into creating seed, a coral glow blooms nonstop from late spring to fall. Next. Uh, now this was a high country introduction back in 2004, I believe. I originally got the uh, seed from Paniote uh, Calades, who is, um, uh, a longtime staff member and wor world renowned plantsman uh, at the Denver Botanic Gardens. And I bought a little packet of seed from his seed company many years ago, Rocky Mountain Rare Plants. And he collected on a, a distant peak down in Southern New Mexico. The original name for the plant in, in the botanic text was Scrofularia macrantha red figwort. Well, when I grew the plant, this is what I saw that you're sharing on the screen. And I said, red figwort, my eye, that is red birds in a tree is what it looks like to me. Just a bunch of cardinals came and landed on the plant in miniature. And so I gave this uh, rare plant the, the common name, red birds in a tree, and it stuck. Fabulous plant for a partial shade. I like to keep it out of the hot afternoon sun. It likes a little more um, regular irrigation, a good deep drink once a week will keep it happy. And it blooms from midsummer till frost and fall with these little red birds that look like cardinals. But as you can see, those little plump flowers are full of nectar that the hummingbirds just love. Next. Now, there are a lot of 
salvias or commonly known as sages can be a little uh, confusing because sages also include the genus Artemisia, which like the great basin sage, those gray leafed fragrant shrubs are also considered a sage. But the salvia is, are a huge family of native and uh, old world plants from all across the globe. This is a very uncommon one that is actually a plant select winner and one that people just aren't aware of and they don't plant. And this is salvia reptans autumn sapphire. So as you can see from the caption, it's September blooming. The common name, uh, West Texas grass sage, because the, the foliage looks grassy. In fact, you would be hard pressed to tell it's a, a, a salvia until you see it bloom. But these uh, deep blue, deep cobalt blue flowers <coughs> excuse me, even though aren't typical of the color that, that hummingbirds like, they quickly discover that it's rich with nectar and the hummingbirds are just all over this for the month that it blooms in September. It's tall and rangy, so I like to put it in the back of the bed. Next. Ah, the agastache, 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 there's, I've, I've heard at least a half dozen ways of pronouncing the Latin genus, but whether you say agastache or agastache or agastache, just say it with confidence when you go to the nursery and the a nursery personnel will, will recognize the, the, the group of plants you're talking about. And agastache are, they have specifically co-evolved to be pollinated by hummingbirds. And in fact, um, you can see this is a little rufus, the little golden rufus, and as he pushes his bill into the tubular flower, you can see right there, those are the um, anthers, the pollen from the agastache flower. And it goes right onto his forehead. So as this hummingbird moves from flower to flower to flower, that little patch of pollen pollinates the flowers as the, the bird moves uh, through the different agastache plants. Now, there are all kinds of wonderful agastaches. This was a high country introduction from 1996, another Sally Walker collection that she made down in uh, southwestern New Mexico, but it's zone five cold hardy, so it'll go down to 20 below zero when established. Very aromatic with the scent of licorice and mint to both the flowers and foliage when you brush against them. And they're uh, midsummer to September blooming. So again, very, very important nectar sources for late in the season, and especially as the hummingbirds begin to migrate south. Next. Now the Zoshneria, or common names include hummingbird trumpet or fire chalice, depending on what part of the West you live, but they're, they're native um, to the Western US. And this was a specific variety that I introduced. This is my first introduction and it is a, uh, a plant select winner. It's been in the program for almost 20 years and still very, very popular as it should be. Zoshneria garedii, orange carpet. Now, as you can see, it's a, a horizontal grower and blooms in the late summer. On the left side of the screen, that's a little rufous uh, sipping at orange carpet at the Chatfield branch of Denver Botanic Garden down there in Littleton, Colorado. And uh, the reason that I introduced orange carpet is that, again, I bought a, a packet of seed, this time uh, from Paniote Kelides, who collected this seed, at, believe it or not, in southwestern uh, Wyoming. So this is uh, zone four cold hardy, 40 below. And I, I grew out the packet of seed. I had about 50 plants growing in gallons. All of them, as uh, Gredii naturally grows, were pushing the branches straight up, except for one plant that was growing in completely the opposite direction. The branches were going horizontally and draping over the side of the plant. It was a good heavy bloomer. And I said, wow, this is something really unusual. So I took that one plant and started to propagate it from cuttings and orange carpet was created. So uh, again, a fabulous ground cover. You can see it growing under the rocks on this little uh, low rock knee wall, good for cascading over raised beds. Uh, just a, a really versatile plant. It does appreciate regular water, like a good weekly soaking once it's blooming. But uh, 
it'll take sun, but keep it out of the real hot afternoon sun and that'll prolong the bloom. And next, next but not least is a, another introduction through High Country Gardens. This is Zoshneria canum, variety Arizonica. And the seed for this was originally collected by Sally Walker in the incredible Chiricahua Mountains down in southeastern Arizona. Hence the name Sky Island Orange. And Sky Islands are mountain ranges uh, in, uh, there are a few in West Texas, uh, a lot in Southern and Central New Mexico, Arizona and Utah. And these are tall mountain peaks that are surrounded by flat uh, plains or desert. So the, the desert floor may be at 3,000 feet, but the Sky Island Mountain may go up to 10 or 11,000 feet. So it creates its own freestanding ecosystem. And each Sky Island has unique uh, animals and plants that aren't found elsewhere because of their isolation. The, the, the seeds and animals can't go across 50 miles of desert to get to the next Sky Island. So the, the uh, Chiricahua Mountains are an incredible sky island. It's one of the last habitats for jaguars. They have natural populations of parrots, mountain lions, bears. It was the uh, final holdout for uh, the Chiricahua Apaches and Geronimo. That's how distant and isolated this sky island is. But by golly, it's got beautiful Zoshneria. And uh, out of a big group that I grew from seeds collected in the Chiricahuas, this particular plant named Sky Island in Orange really stood out for me because of its very long tubular weeping flowers that give it a distinctive look. And as you can imagine, it's uh, for a, a September blooming plant, the southward migrating hummingbirds really appreciate getting a, a good sip of nectar from its flowers. So this finishes up our uh, lunchtime presentation for today. Uh, there is a handout that goes along with the uh, presentation that you can uh, download and print that and have all the plant names that you can look up uh, online and in catalogs to get more information about the individual plants. Again, thank you so much for your uh, support of Rockies Audubon and for your interest in helping and supporting bird populations. Oh, David, thank you so much for regaling us with your wonderful knowledge. And I have to say, not only are you uh, a fantastic gardener, but noting that most of these pictures are taken by you, um, you have a hand in some photography skills there too, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yes. Well, uh, uh, starting and running High Country Gardens for 20 years, uh, I quickly realized uh, that there's just not a, a lot of great plant photography and particularly for a lot of uncommon plants. So just out of necessity, I picked up a camera and thankfully I have a decent eye for it so that uh, you're not looking at out of focus, blurred, blurred <laughs> plant photos as you commonly see. No, they're fabulous. And I just thought, I love all your fun facts and analogies. My favorite one was the fruit smoothie in contrast to the Coca-Cola. That <laughs> well, definitely so something to think about. It does, yeah. So I just loved all your personal stories. It was so eye-catching um, with all the photographs too. And my personal one was on the list. I'm so excited. Was the licorice mint hyssop? Ah, uh, yes. We planted that one in the Old Town Square in Fort Collins. Busy, trafficked area, people dining at restaurants. And we wanted to spruce up one of the garden beds there that really was used as a trash receptacle as people were leaving the, uh. the breweries. <laughs> We, play, we didn't even put in the licorice mint hyssop yet in the ground. They were just containers on a busy sidewalk in the middle of the square and Rufus hummingbirds were <laughs> visiting them. So I saw that and I was like, I, I need those. And so I put them in our container garden this year and they worked out well. So oh, yeah, they, they're, uh, a lot of folks, sometimes they, their soil in their yard is a little too heavy for the agastache in the ground. So put them in a container. They grow as fast as an annual and they're very easy to overwinter in a pot. So a very good point, Jamie, that, that it's a versatile and great container plant. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, David. I'll let you get back out on this beautiful day outside and in, 
in your greenhouse and just want to thank everyone who is able to watch this program and learn about how you can make your yard a hummer paradise and with that we'll conclude our audubon rockies event our noon hour webinar series and again thanks david for joining us my pleasure